Welcome, folks. This is uh, Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee, and this is September 18th. And as I stated just now, to some of the committee members, we have a full agenda today. We are going to be dealing this morning with a lot of Department of Corrections um, issues that <clears throat> to staffing levels, hours that are worked within our facilities and how all that is calculated as well as there is a report at one of our facilities from BOSHA to meet some um, implementation targets to help uh, with staff and offenders in terms of dealing with the oppressive heat in one of the facilities for that. Um, we are going to be putting in air conditioning within some of our facilities, but that is a long term process. So some of this is new. Uh, any questions before we get started here? Um, what I want to do first is get started with a commissioner of DOC just to talk about the 223 schedule and how it's calculated as well. Then we'll hear from BSEA because there's some difference in terms of when it should kick in and how that's calculated. And we need to understand all of that to see how it's working. Um, and then we'll go from there. And I know that we have with us the commissioner of DOC. We also have some correctional officers here and BSAA is also we've got some folks who the field office um, and a lot of that's going to be online on Zoom for that. So Commissioner, why don't you come up? And welcome. Good morning. Uh, I might ask Travis to come up too. We can okay. talk about the mechanics of the uh, schedule itself. Whomever you want. Okay, uh, so my name is Nick Dillon, the Commissioner of Corrections for the State of Vermont. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today uh, to talk about the staffing situation in our correctional system and some of the uh, efforts that we've undertaken to help resolve that. And principally, I think the focus here today is on the schedule. Um, I think it might be helpful if I give you just a touch of context and background to inform how we got to the place that we are. And then I've got Travis Denny here, our facilities director, who can talk about how the schedule worked, why we went to that model, other things that we looked at. Um, and then we can talk about the thresholds we used and, and the voting mechanisms to give people choice in moving to that schedule versus just forcing it upon them. Um, and then uh, open it up for questions if you have anything else. So I joined this department about three years ago. Um, and if you remember, we were about three years ago, still in the kind of tail end of the COVID pandemic. Um, in January, February of 22, um, we hit the Omicron phase of the pandemic. And so it kind of lulled and then reared its head back up. And particularly at the St. Johnsbury facility, we lost a ton of staff to uh, sick leave at that point because of the Omicron phase. It really kind of flooded that facility. And so the facility um, was near the point where we were at our minimum staffing level to keep the facility online. And so <clears throat> over the course of a few weeks, uh, our executive team and leadership from across state government was working to address those issues and figure out how we maintain the facilities that we had when we have 15, 20 staff going out at a time. Um, St. Johnsbury was the first to go through that wave, but it did hit other facilities after that. What we did at St. Johnsbury was go to emergency 12 hour shifts at that point. And the reason for that was if you were only running two shifts in a day, you need fewer total staff to run the facility in a 24 hour period. So we created some savings there. Um, those were an emergency measure. Um, unexpectedly, though, what we heard right away from the facility was that that was preferable. Those 12 hour shifts were preferable to the schedule that we had them on previously, which was a three eight hour shift schedule, a normal kind of 
um, rotating shift schedule. Um, and then we started looking at the data about that facility and across the system more broadly. We brought in our data team and our operations team to study um, how many folks we needed to really baseline. How many folks do we need to run a facility? How many do we need at kind of an optimal level to run the facility exactly the way we want at all times? And then what uh, schedules would help and alleviate those burdens? Because throughout that period, and, and really still to today, to a much lesser extent, folks were working 16 hour shifts. So they're working an eight hour shift and being held over for eight more hours. Um, and so we, that, that happened in kind of early, late winter 22. By July of 2022, we had a 33% vacancy rate in our security staff. So about a third of our security staff uh, positions were vacant. Um, that was untenable. Uh, and so we began to create a plan that ultimately we called the stability and sustainability plan to first stabilize our facilities and then redesign the way we run our system to make it sustainable for the future. So we didn't run into those same issues over and over again. As part of that plan, uh, we studied a variety of different schedule types that were available um, with lessons that we learned from the St. Johnsbury experience and looking around the country at law enforcement agencies, at other corrections agencies, um, and, and slowly came to believe that what we call the 223 or the 5050 schedule was the one that would give staff the optimal amount of time off, uh, which was a, a key uh, thing that we were hearing from our people, um, but also allow us to manage the facilities in a better way. We'll talk about how that schedule works and why we went to that model in a moment. Um, but one of the things that we that was really important uh, in this process is we started surveying our staff and asking them questions like, how do you feel about the work experience? What things do you wish we could deliver to you? How, what what is it that makes you want to work here? What makes you not want to work here? And with that information in hand, uh, it really informed how we went about solving these problems. Um, we also were very keen to use data to include those surveys, uh, but other data that we have from the facilities to design that. So it wasn't just gut-based decisions, like, oh, it feels like we should do X. Um, that had gotten us into this problem in the first place. I raise the pandemic because uh, that's the experience that we started in, but subsequent research by the department and the Department of Human Resources shows us that this problem actually wasn't created by the pandemic. This problem started in 2015. That was the first year the Vermont state government started losing uh, most of our correctional staff. That pattern changed in 2015. And the problem was building and building kind of under the surface until the pandemic exacerbated it, it kind of blew it up into public. Um, and that is also true of corrections agencies around the country. This is not a unique to Vermont problem. Um, our data mirrors that of many other states across the country, including states that don't look or feel anything like us, like Texas and Michigan. Um, all of our staffing patterns and trend lines look exactly the same. You could put them, you could plot them up on the wall and take the name of the state away and they, you'd have three identical charts. Um, I think that's, that's helpful to understand because while Vermont, I think, is maybe on the front end of this, in part because of our demographics, uh, this problem is happening everywhere. And, and we've looked to other partners to help inform how we go about solving some of these problems. Um, so I think maybe good to pause there for a moment and talk about that schedule because i know that's really interesting to you all um so maybe travis if you can describe how it works and then we'll talk about the mechanisms we use to go from what schedule we were on and, and how we got to where we are and, and why we wanted staff to make those decisions sure <clears throat> good morning everybody travis Den, uh facilities division director for VOC. So can I just interrupt, has this been sent electronically to Megan at all so that we can post this eventually on our web page? Uh, actually, I believe you did get this right there. Was it one of the two that you just sent? Uh, I think it was before that. It was yesterday. If we don't, we can make sure we yeah. get it. Yeah. So um, 
the two two three schedule, and, and we can go really deep here and get lost in the in the weeds. So this is an overview. Into the weeds. So I'm gonna do my best. <laughs> I live there, unfortunately. So you keep me keep me honest. Um, this is this is taken from an, info, an infographic that we shared with the whole staff. We were surveying them and explaining the mechanics of the the two two three schedule, which is not a unique schedule to. Um, which is to say that this has been around in many other uh, places besides Vermont DOC for many, many years. But the most simple way, and if you look at the little um, makeshift calendar down in the middle of the page, is over a 14 day work cycle, you work two days, you're off two days, you work three days, you're off two days, you work two days, you're off three days. And the shifts, in order to make that happen, were extended from eight hours to 12 hours. Optimally, that is that's the math, um, and that what that allows us to do at scale is to cover a twenty four seven post. So think of a post that's mandatory, like a, a, we'll call it project unit or something like that. Posts we have to have underneath the old paradigm of the of the three eight hour shifts and the five and two when that was run optimally. So let's pretend there was never any staffing crisis or anything like that. It takes um 4.2 what we, what they call FTEs but their staff it takes 4.2 people to run a 24/7 post for 80 hours for 24/7 for 14 days um underneath this model it takes 4.0 and the point 2 is a little misleading cuz there's no point 2 people out there that's a that's another person and that's without adding on things like we need a relief factor to be added on for our staffing to figure out how many people does it take to run a building optimally with this many posts. It takes more people to run a building on the old paradigm. A small percentage more, but at scale, that turns into 10, 20 people, depending on the size of the building or the size of the organization. So that's what we saw as an opportunity to not only be able to free up the people that we have been allocated, who we could then put in different positions around the facility to do things like get breaks, to do things like get back to the business of good corrections. But also what it did is it right-sized and allowed us a um, something to attract new people. It right-sized the days off. In the system that I came up in, and I, can't, I started in 1997 as a correctional officer, and I worked in the facilities for 15 years, and I'm on my 27th year with the DOC. So I lived this experience. We know he looks very young. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, but when I came in, there was no, for me, I was, I was a single dad. I was here for the benefits. That is not the type of employee that we are seeing today because of either the Gen Z millennials are more about um, they don't, they're not here for the mortgage. They're not, not here to pay for the mortgage. They're not here to, they're like, we want experience. We want time away. We want to be off on the weekends when we can be, we want to be able to experience life with our friends, go to weddings, all those things. When I came on, I had Tuesday, Wednesday off third shift for five years or thereabouts. I had to bounce around, but that was the sales pitches. If you stick it out, eventually you'll get to a day shift with bad days off. And the people who have been around for 20 years or plus, they're going to lock down kind of the best shifts with the best days off. And that was their reward for sticking it out that long. That wasn't sustainable with the, with the employees that we're trying to attract today because they are not enticed to come into a system for a third shift, Tuesday, Wednesday off and, and kind of make it through the, the storm of your first five years in corrections. With this, Everybody, 20 years or 20 days on the job, when done optimally, they get a three-day weekend every other weekend. So that's a three-day weekend every day period. Every but over the, the weekend. The key word is when done optimally. Well, absolutely, and and I would and that is fair. Um, and I would just point out that the five and two that we were on wasn't sustaining these types of vacancies and was not being run optimally either because they, everybody was, they were de facto 16s. And in fact, required more people, 0.2 more people than the 12 hour shifts do. So this concept, this idea that we hear <clears throat> that 
um, oh, you can't run the 223 because it can't be run perfectly is illusory. I mean, that's also true of the 5-2 schedule, the eight-hour shift schedule. No schedule will hold up if you don't have enough people. Uh, and so this idea that if we go back to eights, everything will be better is false. I mean, it's patently false. Uh, it will be differently bad. Uh, but this schedule offers our staff the very things that they have been asking for. Even when it's not run optimally, it still enables people to have three-day weekends every pay period. Uh, and, you know, people are getting called in. There are definitely holdovers, and we understand that, and we're working to get those staffing numbers up. But there, I think that there's a false belief out there that if we switch back to the old schedule, things will get better somehow. The number of people we have available to fill a schedule is the same, regardless of whether we're doing this schedule or a 5-2. And I'd rather have people work 16s with many more interruptions in their work week for time off because it gives them time away from our facilities than work five 16s in a row. I'd like to interrupt mm -hmm. right now to see if there's any questions from the committee on this particular schedule. I'm just curious how many of you end up working 16s rather than 8s, but maybe that's just a more broad question than a specific 2 2 3 question. I mean, in a, I don't have that exact data, but I think some of the staff would tell you, uh, especially when we were in the, the depth of our staffing crisis, that a great majority of our staff were working 16s, mm -hmm. that we were essentially de facto 16s when you run 8s. There was very few people when we were at that 32% or as we came down to 20 or when we'd have uncontrolled leave, you know, call-ins and, you know, people on that need to kind of be relieved from duty while there's a disciplinary issue, things that out of, outside of our control, yes. everybody else got the slack, right? And um, so you were lucky to have an eight hour shift in your in your five day working. And you're lucky um, in some instances to have a 12 hour shift in your, Two two three, depending on what you where your facilities at. But as the commissioner said, the more interruptions in that schedule that we can provide, and the more we can try to create long breaks of relief for people to recharge and refresh. One of the foundational ideas of why we went to this schedule is in talking to folks that work at hospitals. Hospitals have very wonky schedules. Some people work for seven days and are off for eight days, and but. The reason that they told me that they do these types of schedules is because we're not moving widgets and boxes. We're dealing with people. When you deal with people in a high stress situation for five days in a row, 16 hours at a time, compassion fatigue that sets in and the ability to see those clients as people is harder and harder and harder. And that's on healthcare workers who's preset, they're there to help and heal people. And they start to kind of you know, move people's loved ones around to the other beds a little too roughly and things like that because they haven't been able to recharge. The 223 offers the optimal amount of if I can show up for a day and show up for another day, I can be off for a couple of days. If I can do that again, I can be off for a couple of days. And yes, I can't make the wedding on this weekend, but if you have it on this weekend, I don't have to compete with my, with the people that have 20 years in the building and I only have a year in the building because my seniority has now um, is, is utilized differently. It's different. It's usually is there in my, my shift bid and which team I want to be on, which post I want to be in. But it doesn't really. Christmas is almost, you know, like we had a system. We have a system now that half of our our team can be off on Christmas. Half of the CEOs and in, in, if done perfectly, if staffed perfectly, half of our CEOs can be off on Christmas. That's never been a true statement before. On the eight hour shifts, if done perfectly, that's not true. And I think it's important to remember that we can't talk, we can't compare one schedule against another and say one done perfectly and one not. Neither schedule will be done perfectly right now. Uh, so we're trying to find the thing that delivers the most value to the people who have to work there. The questions? Um, in the beginning, when you were developing the plan, how involved were the staff that this plan was going to affect? How involved were they in the development of the plan? So uh, we did a lot of surveying, 
to help gather information at that point on what people needed. And then we went out and collected information. But I think maybe it's a good time to tell you how these got decided because we let the staff decide whether they wanted to go to these schedules. So yeah, I'm, I'm, like I'm, 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 I'm before that. I'm talking about the architecture. I'm talking about actually developing it. Sure. I, I know you said you shared it with the staff after it was developed, but I want to know. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to. So I, I did a lot of work on that. And what I did is every facility has their, sometimes it's by role and sometimes it's just by talent, but they're usually in the supervisory rank or above. And those are frontline staff. So it wasn't by, you know, democratic, you know, majority, but it was certainly with frontline staff whose whole bailiwick is scheduling. You know, every facility has that one or two core people that have been protecting that and that's part of their kind of thing every week every two weeks is to is to figure out how to cover the schedule properly and they know the nuances of their schedules in and out and each facility is a little different and each We're facility is a little different and structurally they're different so they require different things so i worked with those key people at each facility and essentially there was many many drafts of back and forth saying well check this out well, how do you guys do that? And them teaching me and me teaching them and us coming together on how do we take your current resources, look at how they're used in some sites, is this position, are you really getting a bang for the bucket of this position? Could it be used someplace else over here? Which then Chittenden's a great example of a place that was once our, I would say the toughest to staff, the lowest staffing. Once we kind of did a staffing analysis, which was done in concert with their staff, their leadership staff, um, supervisory, we realized that there were kind of, there's a couple of pieces on the board, so to speak, that if you move them over here, you get a whole bunch of extra relief for the staff. Um, and when we did that and then overlaid this program with them, we, we figured out how, it worked better for the for the for the line staff. It does create um, a, a situation where the supervisors have to be a little more savvy and a little more on top of it. But they were continuously; those folks were continuously involved with the with the architecture at each site. Okay, so let me let me so that I understand. Sure. Yep. Um, you you work this out with supervisory staff. Correct. Okay. Um, my question was how involved or line staff. Okay. So because that's who's affected by it. So the supervisors are on it too. Just to, but I but I get what supervisors. Saying. Yes, yeah. Front line supervisor and line staff. But to your point, you're talking about CO1s and CO2s is what I'm yeah. I'm guessing. Yeah. Um they're the ones that are going to be yeah. really affected by this. They they are definitely affected by it. Yeah. Yep. Um and again I I'm not arguing with you, so were the supervisors because they work right shoulder to shoulder, um, but I did not work with front CO1s and CO2s on this. Okay. This, was a, this was a more of a managerial and structural. I think our vehicle to get their input was through our staff survey, yeah. to ask them questions about this, to try to understand, what, give us some direction, what way do you want this to go? And then to give them the choice to move to the schedule or not. And I don't know if this is helpful, um, but as a former, CO1 and CO2 and shift supervisor and chief of security. Um, this is not an old idea. This is something that many of us, when I was single striped on the old uniforms, we were talking about, because we were in my community, our local police department has been on this for 20 years plus. And it was one of the things that people would leave our facility for was the schedule at the local PD. And I know it's a different time, and different so I don't want to make false comparisons, but as a line staff member, this idea rattled around in my head and the head of many of my, my friends and colleagues coming up through the ranks. And I think it just kind of germinated and sat there until the world created an opening for it to maybe seem like something to save us instead of something to change you. So we have another question. I'm, I'm gonna hold my question till after. Okay. Yeah. So why don't you describe how we've got facilities on the schedule? Okay. what that process looked like and the choice and how we did the voting. He's asking me to dip into my memory bank and in my job, my memories could puts nowadays, but I'll do my best. Um, 
we did that staffing analysis with the core staff, the key staff that are involved with staffing at each facility. And then we had them look at the way they operate their facility and say, is there anything we could do better with, with what we have? Some facilities are very symmetrical, meaning the number of units that are there at night have to be run during the day. So a 50-50 schedule looks very symmetrical there. Where there's other sites like, let's say, Northwest State Correctional Facility, where there's these kind of you know, hubs and then units that kind of, so during the nighttime, they can shrink to a very small amount of staff, but then during business hours, they have to expand. So doing a 50-50 there has to look a little different. So we went through, we just made sure we understood the lay of the land. We made sure that certain posts that maybe had been around that were necessary or could have been used better someplace else, that that movement happened. Um, and then we provided them with a draft. Um, and then we started to who did you provide the draft to? The supervisors or the actual COs? Well, so to the superintendents who then disseminated it to the to their staff along with these um, infographics. I know to their staff. Does to, that mean the everybody in the, 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 the everybody, COs? Everybody, everybody in each facility. Okay. And everybody in each facility. With graphics that explained it. So it wasn't just like here's the schematic. And so, I can tell you I fielded a lot of calls from people I've gotten to know over these last three decades on the side as they heard it was coming. And so, can you tell me more about it? Because I got people, you know, the whispers in the wind, so to speak, were out there. And there's there's some anxiety. Um I remember Marble Valley being very worried about um actually being forced onto 512s and wanting this to come in and wanting to not have to go to the mandated 512s as King Johnsbury did. So it, the word was out, but we formally put the word out in a very thoughtful way, along with infographics and explanations that, that penetrated down to the staff. And then we surveyed them and, and we what we did is we looked at the schedule and said, we believe that this becomes viable, and that's a loose term, but compared to the situation where they're in, which was not sustainable at all, it was a little bit of which pain are, are we going to choose here? At this, at staffing threshold X, once we have that many permanent people hired in, we are now in the realm of possibility of kicking this off with the knowledge that there's going to be some pain, or here's a higher number that if we wait until then, we're delaying the benefits you see in this schedule. However, the schedule will work a little bit better. And that still wasn't the 100% that we've never gotten to at every facility, but that was like a little bit better means this becomes more and more viable. So we gave them two thresholds and we asked them to vote and tell us what is your preference. Um, and then, you know, there's many negotiations and whatnot and side letters agreements that um, I think you know, I don't have to go into that, but that is how we, we, and we went site by site, meaning that if a site wasn't there, we weren't having the, comp they, they had the, uh, we weren't really having the conversation. They knew it was coming, but we didn't put it out until they got into what we called striking distance, right? So if they were say six hires away from that low threshold, we would engage that entire staff, that whole team and say, okay, you guys have heard about this 223. We've talked about it on town halls. You've heard, you, heard, you know, Marble Valley went to it. Well, Southern State, you guys, here's your staffing picture right now. Um, one of the one of the um, detractions you might hear is that, well, they were asking people who were permanent, but not yet on the, on the schedule because they've just gotten hired or who were out sick for a long about, you know, or who were on some sort of leave situation where they weren't deployable. And the decision was made at that time is that to us didn't diminish their rights as, as, a, uh, as an officer, you know, that they should have a say because this is the schedule, assuming each of their situations resolve, whether they're back from an FMLA protected long-term sick leave or they're back from a deployment or their situation gets resolved and they get to come back to work, they should have a say in which schedule they come back to. So we counted them when it came to the vote, to, as opposed to said, no, you can't vote because of X, Y, or Z. So they were counted as, as and I'm pretty sure they were union members too, but as full-time correctional officers having to stay in their schedule. Only CO1s and CO2s. We didn't ask caseworkers. We didn't ask shift supervisors. We didn't ask managers. We asked only CO1s and CO2s. So only they voted on their on their 
preference. And then we wash, rinse, and repeated that at each site as they got close to that threshold. And by close, I mean, if we were to hire six and send them to the academy, they might be able to graduate from the academy with this schedule in play. And we tried to be very open that that didn't mean it was going to work perfectly. And we tried to be very clear up front. That means there will be order in, there'll be holdovers. People are going to have to still work 16s, but you could start to get some of the benefit of this. So I just want to be clear so everyone understands that this new staffing schedule, the 223, was did not automatically happen across all the facilities at once. No. What the trigger was, what the, the instigating piece was, depending on for a particular facility, what the optimum standing level would be. That would include COs as well as supervision. Super, supervisors and case managers and all, what the optimum number of employees should be at that facility. And then you took graduated approach and you counted those slots of employees across the board for each facility. And if say they were 80% filled, that would trigger the two, two, three, but before that could be instigated, it would trigger a vote. It would trigger the vote for that facility. Right. So the issue, the issue is how are those people counted? Is it actually bodies on the floor, or is it you've got those positions? And yes, someone's out on leave, someone's deployed. So the number of bodies you've got on the floor is lower than those positions that are filled. And that's where some of the conflict is coming in, in terms of when the 223 kicks in. True. And I want to put that out on the table for folks, because that's the issue. The facility has to be at a certain level, staff, staff-wise, before the 223 can kick in on a vote of the COs in that particular facility. Now, what happens if that facility starts going down in terms of those positions that are being filled. And I'm not talking people on the floor, I'm talking as a whole, what then happens to the two, two, three schedule? So that, that's a great question. And I don't know that we've really hashed out the, like, is there a trigger at which we go backwards? Because I think that would be a, the real detriment. I mean, I think about Marble Valley who wanted to avoid the five twelves at all costs, and we're happy to go to the two two three at a suboptimal level. In fact, I think Marble Valley asked us. They said, "I know this is the threshold you came up with. We're close. We're not right there. We all we, we want to go, and that's what their vote reflected. So we gave it a shot. Um, and I think that I don't know that we've seen a place get onto it and then drop so far that they were back to that stage where." we would have to go to emergency 12s. We went to the schedule when we're at about 30% vacancy rate. Uh, today, we're in the high 17 range. Uh, so we haven't had facilities regress. I mean, they've been blips up and down, um, but we haven't had a facility then like go staggeringly below. And I'll also say, if we switched right now, you would see facilities do that. You would see people leave this, the schedule. And I'll tell you, for the new recruits we're bringing into the academy, we're still running above average sizes academy right now. Every academy since we introduced this plan. Uh, and the vast majority of recruits say the single reason they're there is because of this schedule. And what's the retention of those new recruits? Good question. So that is where we've been focusing heavily right now. So I think we're somewhere in the, we, we are losing about, 40, Isaac has a slide on this, so I don't want to get it too wrong, uh, about 40% within a year. Um, that actually is on, yeah, here we go. So you can see, our, this is our attrition rate. So how many people, what percentage of our staff we're losing uh, within one year? And we're finally bending that curve and headed in the right direction. And if you took this data back further, you would see that our attrition rate has been at that level for forever. 
we've never been able to retain staff. And, and that's what, as we dig into the data, I mean, we hear all this noise about what we should be doing. But when we dig into the data, the data is actually telling a very clear picture. And that is, it's not a recruitment problem, it's a retention problem. And if you look backwards, for the last 20 years, we've been gutting our system of staff. So we have staff who are very senior, and we have staff who are very junior, and we have nobody in between because we haven't been taking care of them. And so this schedule is our first attempt, amongst other things, to actually get them what they have been asking for. Questions, and then I want to keep moving along because I want VSCA to have an opportunity, and I know they've brought some folks, and I know we have some correctional mm -hmm. officers here from St. J facility as well as the Newport facility, and then also I want to get into the VOSHA yep. requirement too. Jenny, so on the attrition it? rate, uh, obviously it's a attrition rate, but then if you put in um, the staffing level, then we would know what the loss was. You said it went from minus 30 to minus 17. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. right now there's a seventeen percent gap in place. Um and is the attrition higher or lower for the I think you said this, but maybe you could repeat it for me. The the new folks or the more seasoned we are having a better time retaining new recruits. Okay. Yeah. Um and so you know we've been working with Texas very closely on this. Texas actually has one of the better data systems to manage their staffing. Um, and they've had to figure all this out in the last couple of years too. Nobody really spent time working on this stuff in corrections across the country. And so there's a couple of states that are finally digging in and, um, and, and what their data showed us, and then we replicated it with Vermont data is, if you can keep somebody by past six months, you're much more likely to keep them in the longer term. If you can keep them a year, you're highly likely to keep them. So our goal now is just to think about how do we keep you a little longer and how do we make this a little better for you so that you actually do find a career here? Because what our staff sur surveying shows us is over 70% of our staff say that they like the work, they want to do the job. They're not leaving because of the work. They're leaving because of the workplace and the hours and the strain on family and relationship. So that's where we need to target. People are connected to the mission. So for the folks who are um, experienced and have been there a while, and there are few, there are more of them leaving. Have you thought about what kind of workplace incentives you can provide so that they don't leave, knowing that that experience is critically important? Uh, for the for the each facility, yeah, we have, and I think this is where we get into another kind of dicey issue: is all the things we think will work, the data ultimately shows us they don't really work. So, like retention bonuses don't actually work. People are more if you give them retention bonuses, they're more likely to leave. I don't know why that is, but that's what the data tells us. Um, and so we're trying things, and then we're measuring. And if it doesn't work, we're going to move on. If it does work, we're going to keep it and find a way to, to maximize it. I think the problem, though, is we actually don't have that many people who are in the category you're talking about. I, I, I think my question's been answered. You said that they're leaving because of the hours, because of the kind of work and the facility. Uh, I don't think they're leaving because of the kind of they're leaving because of the hour, uh, their inability to spend time with family, friends, uh, the robust amount of overtime. Um, but the pay is good. The benefits are great. Uh, and people are deeply connected to the mission. That's what our staff surveying shows. So they care about the work. They want to do the job. But it's, it's too taxing on them as a person. Okay. So you know what the problem is. Well, I would like you to tell me. <laughs> Well, I, I, I think you do. You just, I think you just told me what the problem was. The hours. That's right. Right. The 223 schedule is a effort to target that exact problem. It gives them more time away from the facilities than any other schedule we could do. Yeah, but they're still leaving. <laughs> they're still leaving. In, in yes, but when we were on eights, they were leaving at almost twice the rate that when they were on 12s. Yeah. 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 We are this, so it's getting better. We introduced this plan in 2022, and the attrition rate has been on a positive trajectory. So, yeah, so it's getting better. It's getting better. But I it doesn't feel that way. I mean, you can ask these guys when they come up here. Does it feel better? No. No. 
but we are starting to see signs that it's actually working. And we, there is no like flip a switch and all of a sudden it gets better. We have to figure out what is working and stick to that. And, and I don't know, maybe Travis is like getting paid by the 223 lobby, but I don't think anybody in our system is wedded to a particular solution. We want to find the things that work. And that's what we're up against is, you know, it's, it's tough to convince people to give up something they've been on a long time because it's scary. And I totally understand and respect that. And yet, for the folks who have moved the schedule, at each facility that's voted on this, and now it's been all six, has voted overwhelmingly to move to this schedule. So I don't know who like the, the minority of folks are out there who are like, this isn't working. I, I know they exist, but that's not the feedback I get from our staff. And I understand people understand they're frustrated. The hours are long. They're still working 16. The promise of the 223 is better than the delivery of the 223 at the moment. But as we get better at retaining folks, the virtues and the optimization of the schedule will shine through and it will give people the best balance that we can afford. I think also it's not just the hours. I think the change in terms of the folks who are the residents of the facilities have drastically changed over the last 10 years. Hugely. And I think that's contributing because folks who are now coming into an incarcerated setting have uh, some real severe um, personal situations. Yeah. High substance disorders, it's not alcohol like it used to be, high mental health issues. Mm -hmm. um, it's a whole different clientele there than what has been there traditionally. And I think that's contributing a tremendous amount to the mm -hmm. staffing pressures. Yeah. Because I think people just burn out part of it. And then you add the hours. The last thing I would just like to add, and then I'm happy to Yeah, and I, and I also have a question. Okay, why don't you add this and then I'll ask one. I mean, we hear a lot about, oh, your numbers are misleading. And I struggle with that uh, because there's no other numbers that people have shown us to give us better information. But we really rely on two separate statistics. One is our vacancy rate. And that is just a, a total count of the number of positions we have available and how many are unfilled. Uh, and that, that we look at because we can study that longitudinally over time. And it just gives us a good sense of where we are. That doesn't mean uh, if we have a 70% vacancy rate, it doesn't mean we can run the facility, like we can rely on that total number because it's true that on a daily basis, there are folks out on FMLA, there are folks out on disciplinary leave, there are folks out on military leave, uh, sick leave, uh, annual leave, whatever. Um, so that's the other number we look at and that's the number of daily available staff. And we've gotten really good in the last three years of measuring that. So we know what each facility has on a given daily basis. I'll tell you, though, that the primary driver of the lack of daily available staff is people calling out uh, and getting six slips that say, I can only work this many hours in a day. Um, I understand that because they have been working a ton of hours lately. Um, but it really punishes and penalizes the staff who show up every day to work their shift because when somebody calls out, that means they're getting held over. Um, and so we have good staff across the state who are saying, please help us with this issue. Why are people allowed to just call off their shift anytime they want or call out to, to make themselves have a long weekend, whatever. And that's an area where I think VSCA and the state could work together to improve the situation for the staff who actually show up every day and do the mission. So when you mentioned some side letters about the 2 yeah. and tree and the shift there, the side letters were between the department and VFCA. The state and VSA, but yes. And both sides had to sign off on it? Yeah, they're collective bargaining agreements. They're just in addition to the regular collective bargaining agreement, the annual or the every two year agreement. So it's part of the VSCA contract now? Correct. Yep, and that was negotiated. These schedules were negotiated as permanent feature in the last CBA, the one that took effect in July. July of this year. Yeah. So, I mean, you might remember, Chair, a couple of years ago, uh, Steve and I came in to testify, and, and you asked him, what would it take to fix this problem? And he said, well, you need to inject $20 million into this system. We've actually injected close to $30 million in the last 
two and a half years. Uh, and in addition to that, in the last CBA, we actually created a corrections specific pay plan. So for the first time in state history, the corrections staff have their own pay plan that's separate from the normal uh, collective bargaining agreement. And that's expected to cost us about $10 million more than the previous collective bargaining agreement per year. So we've put our money where our mouth is in addition to doing this other work. And I think that certainly has helped. But the one thing we know is that money is not the solution to this problem. And what's your total DOC budget? Because you don't really get any federal dollars. It's all general. Yeah, funds. we're about 98% general fund. And I think we're about 205 or so million. 205 million. Yeah. Staffing makes up a huge percentage of that total. Staffing DOC also costs the state more than any other uh, state agency. In overtime, about every dollar we spend on overtime as a state, half of that is for DOC. Else yeah. You're all the time paid. What 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 percentage of the budget is that now? Um, our budget? Oh, I don't know that off the top of my head, but it's large and it's been growing. Um, I think we, like I said, we make up about half the state over time. Okay. So let's shift to BCA. C. I don't. You probably have some folks, and I think they're on Zoom. I do, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. Um, for the record, it's Steve Howard. I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont State Employees Association. And joining me on Zoom uh, is a familiar name, Leona Watt, who is a 21-year veteran of the Department of Corrections. She's a supervisor in the Brattleboro mm -hmm. Probation and Parole Office and spent most of her time working in the Springfield Probation and Parole Office. office. Um, Ryan Fogger, Fogergate, I'm going to tear his, destroy his name, who's a CO1 in the Newport facility. Uh, Serena Zahn, who's a CO2 in the Newport facility. And Shawanda Hill, who's a CO1 in the Springfield facility. Uh, they are all here uh, to testify as well. Um, let me start, I think, Madam Chair, first of all, I wanted to say this is the first time I've testified in this committee this year. And, the first time in 12 years that I've been here without Senator Sears at the other end of the table. And it, it does, it's yeah. still, every time I walk in this building, I can feel his loss. I can feel the loss of his, uh, his presence here. Um, so I just want to say that because it's the first thing I thought of when I sat down here just now. Um, I'm going to provide, we provided the committee with a few exhibits that I'm just going to walk you through um, that I think will go to the point that I'm here to, to uh, share on behalf of our members. And BSEA is the authorized and sole representative of the members who work in corrections. We're a democratic organization. Um, people voted to have BSEA represent them, a two to one vote. Uh, so we're here doing that on their, on their behalf. Um, I wanna start because I get a lot of email as you do. <laughs> and I read those emails from, from every member who sends me an email and make a big point. And most of my day is spent reading email and responding to email and phone calls and text messages. But my goal today is not necessarily to say that the 223 schedule is the worst thing since sliced bread and you have to get rid of it. Because it doesn't really matter what schedule you have, <clears throat> 223, whether it's 512s or it's 8s, if you don't have enough staff. No schedule is going to work. And my goal today is to not necessarily talk about the in, ins and outs of that schedule, but to share with you the sheer volume of human suffering that is occurring now in the staffing crisis that faces the Department of Corrections that our members have shared with us. And to that point, I want to just start with an email I received just recently from a spouse who, if I, if I may, Madam Chair, just to give you a sense of what, what is happening here. She says in her email, she's not sure who she should email to, but she starts by saying, I'm extremely concerned about my partner's well being. He is a CO for the Vermont Department of Corrections. The treatment and hours that COs have, have the treatment and the hours that the COs have been subjected to is out of hand. And management doesn't seem to care one bit. I know he has options to quit and get a new job. But he spent six days away 
six weeks away from, from six, six, I think he says, she says weeks, but six weeks away from his family at the academy working and studying his butt off to come back to being forced into mandatory overtime. This morning, I received a call from him crying because he was so exhausted and was forced into a 16 hour shift with only 20 minute break and a 15 minute break. He was covering three units for hours. On his weekend off, the facility called him 13 times and his shift supervisor texted him multiple times. These conditions are inhumane. I worried about his physical and mental health at this point. And I know he's not the only one. And she goes on to talk about how that in impacts her family and her children. And I could provide you with some future meeting, many spouses, children who will come and tell you that under, the six, under this schedule, currently happening in the Department of Corrections. We are destroying those people. We are destroying their lives. We are destroying their families. We're destroying their marriages. All in the employment, in, in employment uh, by the Department of Corrections for the state of Vermont. So it's not about the details of the schedule. We can work on those. And in fact, the vote that the commissioner responded, the commissioner presented on whether to go to a 223 schedule was a demand that was made by the VSEA. There would have been a vote if VSEA hadn't demanded it, which we did, and we're glad that we got it. The problem is what, the, what you heard from Mr. Denton and, Mr. and the commissioner, the problem that was presented at the time of the vote and is still a problem now, is that they counted people who are not available to work. And what that does is skew the whole implementation of the schedule. So for instance, I was recently up at a labor management meeting uh, at, the, at the Newport facility. This just a few weeks ago. The threshold for the 223 schedule in Newport was 79 people available to work to 85 people available to work. That's the threshold that was agreed upon. That would trigger the vote to go to the 223 schedule. At that time, they had 64 people available to work, not 79, 64. Today, they have 58. So that is the that is the, where we started on the wrong foot with this particular plan. So Steve, can I interrupt you there when you said the 69, is that actual bodies on the floor or is that slots that are filled, but some folks are on deployment or family leave? So the information that was put out to the members by the department and the information that you'll see uh, on the schedule is meets the threshold. The people who are actually available to work today in Newport, 58. Not 79, 58. So what you're saying is being calculated on those positions that are full, but not on the actual bodies on the ground that are working, right. bodies on the floor. That's bodies where this started on the wrong foot. Um, and then there's no way, because that was my question previously, what happens when you get below those <clears throat> numbers that would instigate the 223. What happens when you get below those numbers? Does 223 still be in effect? What happens is 16 hour shift after 16 hour shift after 16 hours. Still happening. Still happening. So um, I want to make sure I'm understanding what you say. It's not necessarily the, um, the design of the schedule, the 223, it's implementation of that. And it seems like if you don't have enough people available and willing to work, that it's not really going to matter what kind of schedule you have. They're all going to be working overtime. That's right. Massive amounts of overtime. Right. And as you heard from the so commissioner, that's the why they leave. It's not the design. It's it's the available and willing to work. And I and um, so I I mean I I guess it's important for us to you know, I guess not drill down so much on the design of the schedule, which it seems that like people um, want. Um, well, some do, know. some don't, yeah. <laughs> uh, but as, that's not the issue. As majority, that's right. not the issue. It's, it's the like, issue. How, do we, yeah. how do we ensure, and, and, you know, maybe this is an overhiring, you know, maybe we need to overhire in order to be able to ensure yeah. that people are available and willing um, to work. And I, I recognize people have the right to have the benefits that they're entitled to in terms of lead time and things like that. But um, I just, I guess I don't want us to sort of like 
overemphasize any particular schedule because it's not really going to matter what the schedule is if there are insufficient number of people to work. I think that's the point, uh, uh, Representative Woods, that there is no work-life balance at the moment. People are working massive amounts of overtime. Uh, they are suffering as a result. They'll, one of the things that I've, I've shared with the committee, there's two things that I want to share with the committee. One is you'll see 10 pages of comments from COs, from um, from folks who work in facilities that have shared with the committee that will describe to you what is currently happening. This was this these were solicited starting on August 29th, right up until we walked in this morning. I, I really urge you to read these short statements from the COs and even folks who are working for the health services, the contractor who provides health services, one's a mental health counselor, describing teachers who are teaching in the, in the facilities describing what the Department of Chief Corrections is exposing their members to the inhumane working conditions that they're being that they're being asked uh, to, to, to meet. I also submitted. I just don't want to interrupt, but I have some members that have some more questions. Oh, sure. So, Jenny, and then I saw Teresa raise her hand. So I was going to ask this question earlier, and I'm glad I waited. Um, so the uh, the we have here strategic plan goals, and we've heard the phrase in a perfect world, um, you know, if we had all the workforce and so on. And this is a question I think for both of you really, uh, what guardrails or what rules are put in place? You know, as you're doing, as you're putting in places, I don't care what the schedule is, and I so I agree with those who have said that. I, I do agree with the number of folks who should be on the floor and working. What guardrails are in place, and what assurances are made to workers when they walk through the door that their wellness is going to, just as it says here, uh, not just be a goal, but will be protected. Uh, we, it, it's a concern. It's a huge concern. Senator, I think you put your finger on something. I'm going to ask both of you to answer that question. So can I do that? Mm -hmm. All right. Go ahead. We'll go to the mm -hmm. I think you put your finger on the pulse of something that's really key, because as you'll see in these 10 pages of comments, as you'll see in this petition signed by 260 frontline workers, um, this the current management of this schedule is 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 uh, having a significantly detrimental impact on the mental health, physical health of the people who are working on the front lines and corrections. The problem that they also tell us is that they feel like the effort to push and sell the plan to the legislature and to the public as this is working, this is working, there's no problem here is further demoralizing the troops who are on their fourth or fifth 16 hour day and who haven't seen their family and who have given up on um, any kind of a private life. Because what I think the first thing the union would say is that the management has to start to admit that there is a problem and there has to be some proposals brought to the table to solve that problem. And I know the commissioner doesn't like to hear that money is an, isn't the answer. Money is the answer. We need a significant amount of investment. And one of the things that the so I want to go back then. Um, my question is: Are there guardrails? Are there rules? Are there guidelines in place when folks come in to work that offer some reassurance? It sounds like there are not at this time. And my question is: Should there be? Should there be guardrails? Uh, should there be rules? Should there be guidelines? So when you sign on that dotted line, you know. You're not going to be there for 16 hours, five days in a row, or three days in a row, or whatever the problem is. I think there have been a lot of promises. I'm looking for the solution rather than the problem. Yeah, I mean, I think, that, I think what our members would say, that a lot of promises have been made. But we hope that the department achieves. We want full staffing. We want a schedule that works. We want, the, we want a lack of mandatory overtime. But those promises that have been made are not, are not happening currently in the department. And what we need is a response that is commiserate with the level of crisis we're in. And what we're getting instead is this, well, it's a, it's, it's a lot better than it was under eights. And, you know, you voted for it. And, uh, you know, someday eventually we'll, 
we'll get there. That's the problem is people are fed up and they're leaving. And that makes the problem even worse because as the commissioner rightly said, when somebody doesn't leave or they call in sick because they're exhausted, they're humanly exhausted. They're calling their spouses in tears. They call in sick. Well, of course, because they are sick. That's what's happening. And what we need is a crisis leader to meet the crisis that is presented. So my goal here today and my goal tomorrow, our members' goal, we demanded a meeting with the commissioner as part of our contract. There's a provision for a statewide labor management meeting. We demanded one because we want to make sure that the commissioner actually knows what's happening in his facilities. Sometimes we wonder if maybe the management team isn't telling him the truth, and that's why he's not coming to the table with a solution to a crisis, which is blowing out of control. So you also asked the commissioner the guardrail. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot to digest. I I don't know where this is getting lost, uh, but if anybody thinks that we haven't called this a crisis or have spent three years digging in and actually working to solve it, then they haven't been paying attention. Um, this is, th there's several deep analysis followed up with clear, actionable plans that we have put in place over the last three years. And I'm sorry, but we've been doing it alone. And it's very frustrating to sit here and hear somebody snipe from the bushes and say, why would you call it a crisis? Why are you doing anything about it? We're the only ones doing anything about it. They're supposed to represent their members. Okay, I don't want to go there. I want to go what got to what guidelines are in place when someone walks through the door as a CO1 or CO2. Are there any reassurances? And how do we put those in place so that folks um, don't become burned out? Yeah, I think that's fair. I will make one distinction about the, the schedule. While I agree that if you're not staffed well, no schedule will work. Exactly. There is a difference between the eight hour schedule and the 12 hour schedule. And that is what they won't tell you is that in, on the eight hour schedule, you would work five 16s in a row. Now you work two 16s, maybe three 16s in a row, and you have interruptions where you have days off. And there is a difference there that's important because that gives you time away. So you're only working a few of those in a row, and then you get some time off. Nobody should be working 16. I think we all agree to that. Um, and if we could get people on a straight 42 hour work week, whatever it is, that would be ideal. There are built into the CBA, there are guidelines that you're discussing. Um, and we have introduced a, a whole suite of wellness programs for staff. And, and people take advantage of those to varying degrees in various facilities. That's the green sheet of paper that you have in front of you. Um, if there are additional guidelines that folks think should be in place, we welcome folks to join us at the table and work on solutions. Uh, Teresa, um, thank you, um, Commissioner. You provided us some with some uh, data, and the one piece that we didn't see actual specific data on is the, the measurement of overtime, overtime pay, number of hours mm -hmm. worked. And that would seem to be a relevant piece of information. And, you know, you said that corrections is half of the state's overtime in, in the amount of overtime that's paid. So it would be very helpful to see sort of from this implementation period of when um, sort of prior to having the schedule available. And then as we've implemented the schedule available, what has been the change in OT? Um, yeah. Because that's that's really what I'm hearing here so and that's, that's a good chunk of data that we will have in our response so yeah I'm happy to share that thank you I think that would be helpful and factual um and um help us to um you know make some decisions about whatever decisions we're going to make <laughs> Representative Woods if I can say you're hitting the nail on the head because the issue isn't this schedule or that schedule it's the amount of overtime right which is why I just asked that data. why I just asked for information right. why do you ask that because yeah. that's really the issue it's not that we disagree. We, we can talk about the specifics of a schedule. I will say that the SDA, as the commissioner said, uh, did negotiate, has negotiated in the last couple of years, at least three side letters. And we have a new CBA. This, this new CBA is very different from the previous CBA, and it is, it's controversial. It has, a, it has a profound effect on the overtime 
that security staff are working and it's not universally loved by by the security staff I think that's their state. but one of the things that keeps happening in the department and it I think it is a pattern that we find troubling is that we get a side letter that brings in additional resources that compensate staff at a higher level which is why I say money is really part of the solution it starts to work and then it gets yanked by the administration so we had that happen we had we negotiated a deal with Commissioner Baker, it was working. We were starting to see overtime go down. We were starting to see the problem resolved. Commissioner Demo removed that. And then the, the problem went right back to where it started. We were just recently under a side letter that expired in June that paid double time if people came in to cover over some of the overtime shifts. That was working. It was starting to show promise. And the administration did not want to, su to support that in the new CBA. So that provision is not in the new CBA. There are a lot of provisions, the commissioner's right, that were negotiated by the, by the bargaining team with the state that did make it into the CBA, but double time did not. And if you talk to correctional officers and talk to people who covered overtime, double time was very effective. It was working. And I don't want to say that it's how does that reduce? I'm sorry for interrupting, but how does that actually reduce? That seems like an incentive to me. It's an incentive for people to come in on their days off to work overtime. So, and other people from the field- It doesn't field, reduce the overtime though. That's the ultimate goal. It does if people don't come in um, because there's no incentive for them to come in. Although what is happening now is that on their days off, our members are increasingly being called in on their days off. And you'll see it in these comments. Um, and they're also on standby in many places uh, to be called in. So the days off are really theoretical for a lot of people. Um, and that's what's causing an issue. So it, there's a pattern that we find frustrating that we find something that's making progress, that's it's having some success. And I don't want to say it's the commissioner's fault because it could be the fifth floor saying, you know, spending too much money on corrections. I don't know. But we, we find it frustrating because it was having some positive impacts. And then we lose those and we go right back to where we started. Hey, Bob? Yeah, quick question. First of all, let me state that too. We're we're teetering on the edge of collective bargaining and administration. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. the discussions that we're having, that's not, in my opinion, our job right. here. Uh, Steve, you had mentioned you had 260 frontline signatures. Briefly, what was that for? And the second part of that question is how many frontline workers do you have in the state of Vermont? Uh, I think I don't have the exact number, but I think it's close to 800, give or take, depending on the level of vacancies, and it goes back and forth. But this is a petition that was signed by uh, folks who work on the front lines in facilities and in the field. Um, and incidentally, this issue does not, and you'll hear it probably from, uh, from Leona, um, it does <clears throat> spill into the field because the field has to do hospital coverage that used to be completely assigned to facilities. And they're doing that in addition to their responsibilities as probation and parole officer. There was, an, and I want to give the commissioner credit for creating a, a, what's called the COS team. Problem is it's half the size it needs to be because what's happening is the COS team doesn't have enough personnel to cover the times that the, the P&P officers found problematic, the third shift, night, weekends, and holidays. Those are not being covered by COS. And so our members are being called in to do that or being put on standby. And I just want to describe to you Standby seems like a very benign concept, but what it means is you can't leave your house. You have to be within an hour of the of, of ability to report. Your day, days off basically belong to the department. And what members are saying is we need time away from the department. And yes, theoretically under 223, that's the goal. We want to achieve that goal. We're not achieving that goal. And what we're, what, what is happening instead is People are being driven to the brink and really treated in an inhumane way as employees of the state of Vermont. And we are asking the legislature and the governor to stand with them and to resolve this problem, pressure the administration to bring the resources forward that we believe will resolve the problem. So uh, I know I'm looking at logistics here. I'm concerned about the time frame. I know we have folks on Zoom that want to testify. We also have three folks here who have physically showed up that I want to offer time to testify for that. Bob, do you have a question, a quick question? And then I want to shift to Leona. 
maybe Shawanda. I'm looking at time, and then I want to offer time for the three folks that have shown up here. Just well. a quick follow up, yes or no? Of the approximately 800 frontline workers that you said was that an average, they all had the opportunity to sign on for that petition. So are you telling me 260 out of 800 responded that yeah. the other ones did not? Yes or no? That's the total. I'd have to look at the number for the for the actual corrections units because I don't know if that number includes supervisors. We also represent. Were they given the opportunity to sign up for this letter? They were given the opportunity to sign it, and as you know. No, and as I would say, to sign a petition in the Department of Corrections, given what UVM and what Downs Rackman found about retaliation in the department for speaking out, is quite a, quite a, quite a, a risk that people are taking. Uh, I don't think we want to go there. And um, you kept point, you know, showing stuff that you had, and we don't have them in our packages, and I don't see them on the website. I believe they were emailed to Megan yeah, this morning. Okay. I think I I yeah, we'll sort that out. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we want to make sure that Megan has. Can we hear from Leona? What? I think that we'd yeah. like to move on to that. Sure. Thank you. I'm just, I'm just concerned about scheduling right now because we've got some scheduled at 1130 and we still need to talk about the VOSHA protocol. So I'm trying to juggle our schedule. Did you have something for Steve Tucker? No, I no. Uh, let's move on. Okay. Because uh, I'm I have my own idea. Yeah. On this. Well, this will be something we'll probably continue conversations yeah. at our next meeting. Thank you. But I wanted to offer time um for Leona Watts. Um maybe Shawanda, I'm not sure yet because I'm still trying to juggle our schedule. And then I want to offer time to some of the members who have shown up here personally. So Leona, welcome. If you could identify yourself for the record. Hi everyone. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. My name is Leona Watt. I am the VSEA legislative chair for the um legislative committee for VSEA. I'm also a 20-year, Steve gave me an extra year. Thanks, Steve, but I'm a 20-year. Mm -hmm. um, corrections employee, and currently I do work out of the Brattleboro Probation and Parole Office as a supervisor. Um, I am here on my own time, and I am so proud to be here to represent the state of Vermont employees for the Department of Corrections and all state of Vermont employees in, under VSEA. So um, I, I'm going to go really quick because I understand um, Chair Emmons, you know, got to move it quickly because we're short on time, but I just want to just give a brief story really quickly before I go into the things I wanted to talk about really quick. Um, briefly and just quickly, because I've been listening to everything that everyone has said in that room. And I wish I could be there in person, but um, unfortunately I wasn't able to. So quickly, last year I lost my mom to, and it, it rocked my world. She was my best friend. I took a vow at that point of how do I go on and how do I move forward to honor my mom? And as I, you know, whenever I reach retirement age, right, that's my hope, right? I want to live a life of service. And that has been my goal to live a life of service. So I've been doing a lot of volunteering. I've, you know, been doing a lot. I've been involved with even more in VSEA as in the legislative piece and all of that. And in that life of service, I get emails from state employees, from all the different departments, not just the Department of Corrections. But lately, it has been the Department of Corrections. And in this life of service, it's not about me. It's about representing those who are coming to me to have their voices heard. Because there is no split between DOC, the Department of Corrections, and our central office, and VSEA. We all care about the employees. I think everyone cares about the employees, except VSEA is tasked with that being their only goal. They get the emails, VSEA get the emails, they get the personal stories in person of, we need help. And it's not that there, there is no help being offered. So I just wanted to put that out there really quickly. So moving on, the emails I've received, the people who have come up to me about the hospital coverage that is being done by the field, we are covering the weekends because our cause team is stretched during the weekday. They're doing 12 hour shifts. They also need a work-life balance, right? They also are Department of Corrections employees, state employees. So yes, they need days off, but their days off were coinciding with holidays and the weekends, which led to the shift of the field being put on those. And we're just sort of like, you know, oh my gosh, where's the break? And I have employees coming up to me going, 
Leona, why, why is this still occurring? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have an answer, but I can forward this on when I have a space to speak about it. So I'm simply saying this, the understaffing, the shortages in the jail influence us so greatly. The fact that I love the cause team, it is one of the best things that has come to the Department of Corrections in regards to the hospital issue, but we need more resources with the cause team to better be effective in making sure that the field can do the job that they are there for. We're supposed to be protecting the community by meeting with the supervised individuals in the community, doing all of that work, but we're also having to split our time by sitting in hospitals. And I also do that. And I'm just gonna put my little piece on that. I do that as well. And I don't mind doing it because I'm, we all, we're all part of a team. My, you know, we talk about it. Our brothers and sisters in the facility, we are not different. We're all on the same team. And I want them to have a life and to be able to breathe and be able to live their full life. And again, in this life of service, I'm ready and I'm willing to be here and to put myself out here to say, something needs to change. And I'm going to just, I'm going to be very honest. I know for a fact in that room right there, you have some of our central office people, you have Commissioner Demo, you have Director Denton, you have other people from our central office. And I know they care about this issue. This is not about them not caring. I know they are doing what they can and they're doing it right now. They're working on this issue. It's just that we at VSEA and as the legislative chair still have to share the personal experiences of those who are coming to us and saying, we understand they're working on a solution. We just want the urgency to be there and the push to say, you're working on this solution, but let's just create that urgency because we need help right now. We need help right now. We're suffering right now. I got an email from this gentleman at the Springfield facility. And, you know, it hurts to read some of the things that is being reported about how it is to work 16s and not to have days off even on the 223 schedule because they have trainings or they're being called in for a four hour shift on their day off. That hurts because I am not one to change it or correct it, but I am here to just say, whether it's the facility or we're looking at hospital coverage from those employees, my coworkers, people all over the state who are going Leona, hospital coverage is not what we want. And it's hard to keep employees when you're going, hey, you're gonna be doing this third shift. Do you mind that? Yeah, you're gonna do it two days in a row or something like that. It's not that we're doing it every single week. We're just saying hospital coverage is due to the understaffing, the shortages in the jail. We have the cause team, but we don't have enough cause to cover the hospital coverage and it still bleeds to the field. So at the end of the day, the things that are occurring, the solutions that are being offered by our central office for the Department of Corrections, we are so thankful for those solutions being offered and being worked on. We just wanna make sure the sense of urgency is there to say people are weighing staying in this job right now due to, the, due to feeling so overworked and tired. And that's the facilities and that's also the field. Thank Hello. you. Leon, I want to thank you for your testimony. Uh, it's been very helpful. Other questions for Leona? For that? Teresa? Um, I guess it's not specifically for Leona, but um, what I hear running through my head is things that we will probably hear this afternoon or that we've heard from other state departments. DCF is the one that pops into my head right at this moment. And I, I just think it, it speaks to the status in general of the state workforce. And um, at least in, you know, these two departments, and I think you would probably hear from other departments as well. Um, and I'm just, it's just a statement. Everyone's under stress because everyone's understaffed. Understaffed, yeah. So I need to kind of move this along because I want to offer Shawanda time. And the other folks, um, Megan has been in contact with the other folks on Zoom to submit um, some written testimony for that. And then after Shawanda, we'll go to the three folks who are here, correctional officers, all three of you folks can come up together. 
Um, we're going to shift the schedule a little bit, the Medicaid waiver update and the uh, update on Act 159. We're going to postpone that until October. For that, because I also want to get into the um, VOCHA protocols, the proposal for that. We need to get updated on that. So, Shawanda Hill, <clears throat> you um, unmute yourself, possibly uh, take yourself. Uh, are you there? Is she there? Hello, everyone. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, welcome. And if you could just identify yourself for the record, the records. Okay, want. sure. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Shawanda Hill, CO1 from Southern State Corrections Facility in Springfield, Vermont. Um, I've been a correction officer working since 2013, so 11 years and two months. And um, I do have a lot to say, but I realize you're out of time, so I'm going to totally respect that. I have three pages worth of stuff I wrote down. And I've also been taking notes as you folks have been talking. Um, but like I said, I'm going to respect your time. Um, Steve and Leona, I want to say that I appreciate your testimony because a lot of what you had to say is also in my letter that I have written. So I want to say some things from my paper, but because we're out of time, I'm just going to try to talk about the most important things that I can offer. And I am going to the meeting tomorrow for the state while labor. So I'm going to hopefully be able to have, uh, have more time to say some of the things that I wanted to say today. Um, so what I would like to say is um, I heard some talk in this testimony about um, the the schedule, 223 schedule, and did the staff had a lot to do with that? And I want to say, I've been in corrections for a decade, so I've been around. And that conversation has come up year after year after year about us going to 12 hour shifts. And while I was there, from what I have seen, heard, and witnessed, lots of staff, lots of staff with seniority did not want that schedule. They all, in my facility, was totally against it. Now, I thought it was going to be a good idea because the concept of us having more time off just seemed really, really good. Now that we've been in this schedule for a few years, it's not good at all. It made things completely worse. The new people came in because they was off for every other weekend off, da 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 You know what? I looked at that built-in board at work when I was there last night. I worked last night, third shift, by the way. So I haven't been asleep and I stayed up because I needed to be here to talk. But um, I looked at that built-in board, the last 10 academies that went to the academy, you know what? There's two people left from each of those pictures. I said, how could something like that happen? Every picture that was posted on that wall, except for one that had a bigger group, and maybe it's about four of them, there's two people left from each academy. I'm like, how could this happen? Now, I have spoke to the new people. And new people are flying out the door like the building's on fire, okay? They're they're running out the door. As a matter of fact, um, some of you may remember me from a couple years ago because I was up here doing a testimony about this same situation. Um, and if you don't, it's online so you can read it. Um, what happened then was we lost four dozen senior staff that ran out that door because they was forced out by the 233 schedule because they didn't want it. They was forced out by the working conditions because the working conditions are so bad that place is getting unbearable to work in. So let me just tell you, when you in those units that have no window that opens, there's no fresh air, not even an ounce of fresh air coming in there and you're stuck in there for 12 and 16 hour days. You want to know what it feels like? I said it before on that other meeting, it feels like you're in the cremation center. You're burning, you're sweating. Matter of fact, people been falling down to the ground for the last 20 years that that place has been open. Staff and inmates been hitting the floor, let the ambulance one after another, one after another. This year it happened and I decided that I was going to use that information. Everybody I saw that hit that ground, I wanted to know about it because I sent it to the union and I said, you know what? How many more people is it going to take to hit this ground before you realize that this heat exhaustion is really real? Now, can you imagine, any of you guys sitting there, can you imagine clocking into work for 16 and 12 hours 
and, and my floats come in my unit, they're pouring down sweat so bad. And the first hour of our 16-hour shift, 12-hour shift, or whatever shift you want to call it, they're pouring down sweat. That is inhumane. How can people work like that? Yes, staff and inmates both. How can people work like that? Right now, what's happening in least a southern state, every other day, the whole entire facility is locked down. The inmates are stuck in those cells. They cannot get out because we don't have enough staff. Every other day, this is happening. Now, like I said, I've been around for a while, right? Luckily, we don't have that population of inmates that we had a few years ago when things were popping off every five minutes, 1033s, 1033s, and you're fighting. You're fighting, fighting, fighting. We, the inmates are being a little bit more considerate, and they're not, like, fighting us. They're upset, but they're not fighting us. And, you know, so I want to talk about that because that is real. Um, I don't think the staff wanted that schedule. I don't, and we talk about surveys. Steve just said he put out a survey and the numbers might be 800. He got 200 signatures. These surveys aren't working because you know what? By the time you start collecting the information and putting it together, those people gone. They moved on. They don't even work there anymore. The old staff that I had working there with me, the four dozen that left the original staff that was very knowledge and, and was running the facility without the problems that we're having with a lot of new people, they did not want to leave that job. They were forced out of that job. Working conditions, the 16-hour shifts constantly, uh, the two, three schedule that's not working. And what's concerning to me is it's not working. Some people may think it is, but it's definitely not working. Things have gotten a lot worse. I know that a few weeks ago, we were down to like 48 staff, right? Since then, more people have quit and more people are planning on leaving. So what's going to happen when we get down to 30 people, 25 people? Who's coming? Who's coming in to help us? Right now, we're very appreciative of probation and parole. Yes, they've been stepping up. Yes, they've been coming in and they've been helping us. But you want to know something? Those people got families too. And it's not fair to them and it's not fair to us. It's not fair to anybody. The supervisors, I, I think I heard some talk about that. Uh, was the supervisors the one to approve the 12s with the COs on it, da, 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 da. And they, someone said, yeah, the supervisors was in on it. They approved it, da, da, da. It's not affecting them. They're not working mandatory 12s, uh, 16s. When they, when they get done with their shift, they go out the door. Now, I'm not going to say that about all supervisors because, yes, some of them do step up and they do work overtime. But they do have the option to have a three-day weekend if they want to, okay? So um, an example of that would be like, today's my day off, but I decided I'm going to come to this meeting. Tomorrow's my day off, and I'm driving up to Waterbury for that meeting. Do you know I got hit for overtime on my day off? So when I come back from Waterbury after running around, running with no time to myself, I come back from Waterbury, I'm hit to go back to the facility to work overtime because I was ordered to do so. Staff members that I work with, they don't want to call in because they know how much the next person's hurting. So they come to work sick. Guess what happens when people come to work sick? Everybody else gets sick. Everybody. Everybody else gets sick when people come to work sick. People are burnt out. There's, there's uh, CEOs that crash their car on the way home sleeping. And I'm not talking about one or two. Let's just give it about a dozen, okay? CEOs are falling asleep in the units. And then they're being put out on this, uh, what you call it, RFD. Oh, you fell asleep, da 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 da. Whatever, right? We're in a crisis situation. At some point, you gotta pick. Listen, if you're doing sixteens every day, you're not gonna come to work doing jumping jacks. Of course, you're gonna fall asleep every single time you're working. You're doing sixteens. Oh, it doesn't stop there. Let me give you a little bit more. Not only are you doing sixteens every shift that you're working on your days off, you're gonna come in, okay? Um, then we got the mandatory core cops. And if you don't get those done and you go apply for a promotion, they say, sorry, we can't give you a waiver. You're not called up. Oh, well, move on to the next person. Now we got brand new people that don't even got, listen, brand new people that's being promoted and they don't even know the job. Okay. New people teaching new people. This is what happens when everybody else get pushed out that had time in. And then I'm going to give you another scenario. So me, for an example, I had I decided to leave corrections for a year just about a year ago or two years ago. I went up to the state hospital. Then I decided the gas was too much for me. Da, 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 da. I went back to correction. When I came back, you know what happened to me, but you can't keep people. But guess what happened to me? I lost my seniority. So people who didn't even have maybe a year in, they then had more seniority than me because it's in the policy or the protocol, whatever you want to call it, is in the book. 
that when you leave corrections, even for a day, this is what I was told. When you leave corrections, I was transferred out of there. I didn't go to McDonald's. I went to another state job. When you leave corrections, you lose your seniority. How fair is that, that I come back 10, 11 years, and now new people got more seniority than me? It's not fair at all. Not only is it not fair, how many other correction officers do you think are going to come back and want to help when they know they're going to come back and start at the bottom? So there's things that's out there that we can do that can make it better, but for some reason, it's not happening. So, Chawanda, this is really, really helpful. Um, I'm just getting concerned a little bit about the time. Um, you've given us some very good examples and really relayed some real life situations, which is really helpful for us, but we need to move along here. Any questions from the committee? Um, no, I'm glad I was able to share what I was able to share. I did uh, speak to a lot of staff and a lot of the comments that they were saying, I don't know how much longer I can do this. This place is really killing me. We got we got CEOs that's 20 years old that can't do it. Okay, it don't matter how old you is, nobody can do 16s every single shift. People are, are leaving, good people. They know how to work, they can do the job. But the 16s, every time you turn around, it's killing us. Now that we've been doing it for so long, where's the help? Who's coming in to relieve us so we don't have to do this every day? So we're, and, we're, and we're, we're here, the it's Shawanda, we're <clears throat> hearing this. And um, I am going to have to move this along because okay. we got some other issues as well that we need to deal with. Um, I, I, I understand and that late. and I respect that. I just want to say one more thing. We are in a crisis situation and in a crisis situation, you don't take what little incentive you have for us away. Mm -hmm. When the voting came around for the two, two, threes and for us to move on, they included probation and parole, caseworkers and everybody to vote on that contract. You know what that contract said? Establish 12 hour shifts. Those 12 hour shifts don't affect those people. I'm not understanding why they got the vote on it. But I'll, I'll, I just want to give you that information because that's important. When we talk about they voted for this, no, we did not vote for this. What CEO do you know is going to vote to work 16s every day? The people that voted for this, people that probably shouldn't have voted for it because that language should not have been written on that contract. So that's part of uh, VSCA internal workings with DOC that goes beyond what we, we deal with as legislators. But I want to thank you for your testimony, and I am going to have to move it along. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate you listening to me, and I look forward to um, continue to advocate. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So for the three correctional officers that are here in the room, why don't all three of you come up? We still do want to talk about the VOCHA protocols. We do need to talk about that. I'll introduce myself. My name is Jeff Reynolds. I've been a correctional officer for about 11 and a half years, all at the Northeast Correctional Complex. Um, and that's up in, in St. John's Bay. So, <laughs> your picture here is keeping staff because when I started, it was eight hour shifts. My eight hour shifts were 16 and 12 hour shifts every single day, like I'm doing right now, except it was five days in a row. I can tell you that my daughter was born just before I started in the Vermont Department of Corrections. At four years old, my daughter looked at me and she said, Daddy, why would you rather be with the bad guys than me and mommy? All right, if you don't understand that, that kills you. It and there is no answer for that. You can't look at your child and give them an answer to that question. The daddy doesn't want to be with the bad guys, but daddy has a job to do. Daddy wants to provide for his children. So the Vermont Department of Corrections has gave me an outstanding life. I grew up a farmer. I grew up a logger. This is, I have an outstanding life. I drive a brand new pickup. My kids both have race cars and I provided it. The Vermont Department of Corrections has done everything I believe that they could do to benefit us. These 12 hour shifts, I wrote to the commissioner and asked for these 12 hour shifts. Brian Smith wrote to the commissioner and asked for them because I had staff coming up to me and crying and saying, we don't know what to do anymore. We want to die. And this was on eight hour shifts. 
We went to the twelves, and at five twelves, for the first time, we had consistency in our lives because we were working five twelve-hour shifts. On this, I have seven days that I need to work. Do I go in on my days off? Absolutely, and I do it for my team. But on the flip side of it, I still have time off. I have time with my children. I have the best bond with my children that I've ever had, and I need to thank you for that because. There's no, you don't understand it until you have to live it, all right? Are these shifts perfect? No, everybody would love to work an eight-hour day. I would love to go in, get out at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and go barbecue. Sure, I'm 10th in seniority at 11 and a half years in in our facility. I have seniority that if we were on eight-hour days, I'd have every weekend off. But you know what? Realistically, I also understand that with the schedule we have now, that helps maintain them new people. Since I've been there, and I wish I had a list that I had started when I started in corrections, because I could bring you people. I'm the, there's only two of us from my correctional academy that are left in the entire state. All right. I started in 2013. This problem is not a new problem. We've been purging people since I worked for the Vermont Department of Corrections. This schedule gives us a life. It's not the answer to our problem. We need to find the answer to our problem. But rather than demanding that we find answers, we need to collaborate and say, okay, what are the answers? Talk to the people like us that are sitting in front of you and say, okay, what ideas do you have? We are the ones that live it. So we might have ideas. Are they all going to work? Absolutely not. But we can present ideas. Somewhere something has to give. The commissioner went with ideas. We gave him ideas. We said, sir, your staff are dying. Like, we're on a breaking point and we're going to lose this facility. Uh, again, I got to thank you. you. You saved our facility. Are they working everywhere? No, I'm not going to say that it's ideal everywhere. But another problem you had is you had so many senior staff that didn't want to give up that every every weekend off. They didn't want to give up everything that, you know, I went through the Tuesday, Wednesdays off. Like you said, I, I went through that. I worked my way to weekends. I'm willing to give up every weekend off so that everybody can have a slice of that pie. That's part of working as a team. And that's part of what we need to collaborate. So I realize you guys are on a time. Strategy and I appreciate your time, but I just want you to know that this isn't a matter of eight and twelves. Because if it was, I would vote every single day for twelves, because the eights were sixteens and twelve and sixteen and twelve, and it was in at six this morning, out at six the next day. You were all over the board. There was no sleep pattern. The only mandatory was eight hours between. That was it. So. You were all over the board. Now, I'm either in four hours early or I'm out four hours late. I volunteer for my overtime. So I pretty much, all of mine is just, I stay late. I stay the next four hours. It's It works for me that way. It works for my family that way. But I'm not all over the board. So if you want my opinion, eight or 12, I'm going for 12s every single day. Brian? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Brian Smith. I'm a correctional officer too in St. Johnsbury. Been there about 18 years now. Um, when St. Johnsbury was at the tail end of COVID, as Mr. Demel said, we were at a breaking point. We were working five days a week. Uh, there were supposed to be eight hour days, but if we didn't work three 16s and two 12s, then it wasn't a normal week. Uh, this happened for months on end. Excuse me. That became the normal. And it was killing us, like literally and figuratively. Uh, we had staff that were literally contemplating suicide as just a means of escape. And that, that is not a joke. Uh, we had staff that were driving off the roads almost daily. We, we begged the SEA to come up with a solution to help us. And it, at the time, it fell on deaf ears. We wrote to Mr. Dell and we told him the situation we were in. And we offered a couple of ideas, including the 223 schedule. And shortly after, we were told that 
All right, we're going to do this regardless of the VCA fighting against us being a guinea pig facility. We're going to try it. We're going to do it. And NECC became the guinea pig facility for the state. And it was a night and day difference going from five twelves and sixteens to I work two sixteens or two twelves and then I have time off. I can take a break. I can get out of the facility. I can see my family. It was a huge night and day difference going to this schedule. And yes, the city staffing is low. Well, it is a crisis. But we are working. We haven't gone to a mandatory overtime on our days off. Not yet, because our facility, we're still able to volunteer enough to keep us from doing that. We understand that we're on the brink of it, but we're saying we don't want to go to that. So people are stepping up and saying, okay, I'll take that four hour shift on my day off. Yeah, okay, I'll take that four hour shift on my day off. And we're able to work together as a team. If we can get VSEA and the city to come together as a team, instead of barking at each other, we can probably come up with a lot of good solutions. So that's pretty much what I have to say. Thank you. Good morning. My name is John Lott. I work at Northern State Correctional Facility as the CO1 in Newport. Oh. Um, I've been there for about 12 years now, coming in um, December. Um, so a little background for me. Um, for a while, I had an exemption. I wasn't able to work. I had mental health issues. Um, I started that in leave 21. I went to the facility, stated I was having suicidal ideations, wasn't doing well. They set me up with a therapist. I spoke with her every week. And at one point it came to the conclusion that I couldn't do overtime. I no longer, after we switched to 223, a little bit before that, I was super hopeful about it. I no longer have an exemption or anything like that. I do overtime. I no longer take any medication whatsoever, all because of the 223. My stress levels are massively lower. I have four young kids. I get to see at least seven days a week. For our facility, um, the old 512s that we were doing, we were guaranteed your 240 hours every month. That's every two weeks or every four weeks, you're doing 240 hours. On average, we have an ordering list that tells us what we have for pages. So if you volunteered or you got ordered, you got a page for that. So we got to see that every week on average. We would drug around every month about four pages to five pages, depending on a staff member. And that came out to about 256 hours of over, or 256 hours of working every month, and you're only guaranteed eight hours off. Now, for the newer staff, that could be a Tuesday, Wednesday, every day, and that's all you're getting. Some staff were coming in on their days off to make those pages, so they didn't have to do 16s, but you're still going to come in and work six days. There's no guarantee for that. With the new one, we're only scheduled for 168 hours every month. Now, out of that, 16 of that is already built in overtime because every pay period, we get built in eight hours of overtime, which is awesome in my opinion. I, right now, it's the 18th. I'm on page three or four right now, which means I've only done three or four hours blocks of overtime, which is 16 hours. On average, we run around 12 for what we've seen. That's 216 hours per month. That means we've lost 40 hours of overtime a month since switching to 23. On top of that, with what we have for standby, we scheduled, we have a standby, never do standby more than two days in a row, at least for our day shift. Night shift, we are working towards that, but for day shift, <laughs> don't do more than standby two days in a row. It's only for one pay period on, one pay period off. One pay period we'll do for one month, we're three days on, for the next month, we're four days off. So you're only ever doing in a total two months, seven days of standby, as long as we're on day shift. Night shift, we are working towards that and getting to that. So I still am guaranteed 10 days off every month. So that's still two more days off. For new staff, <laughs> they're now guaranteed the weekends, at least some month. They did not have that. We have, if you look at our seniority chart, we have a year where, and I think it was around like 2022, we didn't hire anyone at Northern State. We couldn't get anyone. They left, came, gone, whatever, they're gone. There's a whole year where we're missing seniority staff. On the 223, we have a bunch of people coming in. It is immensely better. We now have 20 year retirement. We have, it, our leave is the exact same as when we were on eight hour shifts. 
So I had the same amount of days off I can put in for. So I still accumulated, I believe it's 18 days of vacational leave, but I've already got only working half the year. Now I might have some standby days I have to put in there, but that's fine. I still have more chances to see my kids, more hope for the future to see my kids more often and be there for the parts of their life. My wife is, we were contemplating divorce at one point. Now, me and my wife have never been closer because of the schedule. She tells me this every day. I get to spend time with my friends and family. I could not do that before, especially on five phones. I now see them all the time. The 223 might not have fixed everything, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. It was definitely put forth with the thought of senior staff don't like it because guess what? Yeah, a lot of them, they're going to have to get up on their Saturdays and Sundays or, you know, for us, we were, you had Sunday, Monday or Friday, Saturdays, depending on which one, guaranteed. Well, now you've got to work at least one weekend, but this gives a chance for the newer staff. Myself, I took Wednesdays, Thursdays, I believe it is. Now I have seven days off. I only use 24 hours of leave. I got a seven day stretch. The hard thing with five calls is what I always refer to as cumulative stress. By day three, you're burned out. Day four or five, you're not going to make it. Whether it's you've just done 12s, let's just say you did 12s the whole time, you're still going to be burnt out by that fourth, fifth day. I never get there. I know I'm Monday. Okay, rough day. I can make it tomorrow. Awesome. I got two days off. My weekend, I know if I want to do overtime, my 12th day, my first day, I do a 12. I sign in to come in early. I do a 16. Next day, I sign in to come in early. Did a 16. I did a 12, a 16, a 16. I got two days off and next week, I know I got a three day weekend. I'm happy, beyond happy. I have a 20 year retirement and I'm making almost six figures, well over six figures. I have everything I want. Plus I still kept the same amount of leave accrual and I can comp time. So if I do overtime, I can comp it. Now I have more time off with my team. And there's chance for newer staff to get time off. We have put forth a conscious effort to do things for newer staff. And I think that's what, you know, Commissioner Demel and Draft Senate have done a great job of is we were failing. We were down for our facility. We're like upper 40s. Now we need to have like 90, I think it's like fully staffed. We have 92 slots, I believe it is. We were almost at half capacity when we decided to start talking about the 223 and things. And we started making a positive trend. And for us, I'm trying to get a little, Everything is better since we've switched to this. We have more staff. Newer staff are staying. We're getting those bodies in there now with the newer schedule. They're coming in. They want to come in because we're at least giving them a chance at weekends. Before, we didn't do that. They'd walk in. Okay, yeah, not getting the weekend. I know of one staff member that left because he couldn't get weekends. He put in, I think it was 80 hours worth of week. Couldn't get any of it because he couldn't get a Friday Saturday. Mm -hmm. So that meant he didn't for six months have a Friday, Saturday, unless he booked off to see his family. And he had two young kids. So we left. I think 223 is a step in the right direction. I'd just like to add something real quick. And I know we're short on time. Just for perspective for you folks, a new employee coming into corrections before this schedule could go seven, eight, nine years without seeing any part of the weekend off. Right now, a brand new employee every other weekend they get three days. Even if they have to come in for four days on that weekend, they still have the rest of those that time off to see their family. I just, as I said, I want to put that into perspective where they could go eight to 10 years without ever getting a piece of a weekend before this. And I think it should be mentioned that to take leave, if I wanted, if I got Tuesday, Wednesdays off and I want to take off a week, trying to get that Friday, Saturday or Saturday, Sunday, you're not good. So you cannot, it was impossible to get a weekend for a full week. So you can never get that seven day stretch if you wanna go on a nice vacation with your family. It's not gonna happen for the new staff. And that's all we have most of them still now. We have a lot of people that are under five years seniority. They're not touching it. With this schedule, you only gotta put a Wednesday, Thursday. There's plenty of Wednesday, Thursdays out there for us to put in for it. You're guaranteed to get something. I'd just like to go back to this gentleman real quick. You asked the VSCA earlier about their petition and only having 284 signatures. The reason they only had 284 signatures is they only had 284 people that wanted to stand behind it. 
the rest of us stand behind the schedule. That's why he only had 284 signatures because the rest of us didn't sign that petition. So <clears throat> I know everyone's focusing in on the 223. I think the issue is how do we, we can recruit, how do we retain, and how do we make sure that our facilities are staffed at the level they are required or should be staffed at. I, and that's, that seems to be the pressure point for some of the, like St. Jay, it looks like you're pretty well staffed. Newport, pretty, you're getting there. We're, uh... Other other facilities are really struggling. If you hear some previous testimony, people are leaving other facilities. That's going to put more pressure on the two two three. That could put pressure on the eight hour. But, but the doesn't matter. It's because there isn't enough right. staff. The here. bigger problem. You ride down the street now. Look at any one of your your local restaurants anywhere. There's help on the signs, and no one wants to work anymore. No one wants to work, and that's that's a culture problem. So I, I don't know all the answers and how we combat against that. I do know that if you all ever want ideas or you want to hear what we have, like there's a lot of us that have ideas on things that maybe would make people want to stay. Mm -hmm. One that I had really quick, and I realized it would be logistically, it would probably be a nightmare to try to figure it out. But once it was figured out, we know a total hour, the total number of hours that we work in a year. And if our overtime hours could get applied to the back end of our retirement, so I'm no longer working these hours for nothing other than just money. Now, I know. So if I, in the course of my career, I work six, out, six years worth of time in overtime, that gets cut off the top end of my retirement because I gave that, them years to you. I just gave them to you in a, in a different manner. Something like that, I think, would make people want to stay. Because, okay, I'm working the overtime, but I'm getting my life back in the end. I'm giving it to you now, but in the end, I get this, this time in my life back. Something like that, I think, makes people not be so upset with the amount of time that we have to work. Because I'm at least gaining my life back. So, like I said, if you ever want to, uh, I'm more than glad to talk to anybody and give them ideas that we have. I, and selling back sick leave. You want to get people to stop using their sick leave on a daily basis every year have an open window where we can sell back some of our hours even if it's at a reduced price it would give us an opportunity that's money that we're going to be getting anyway that's the money that's already allocated a lot of mindset of, of people is when i when i get done i lose all these hours i don't get paid out for them you do the rest of your leave so they're going to use it because they're it, what good to do to save them so if they could sell it back, like he said, I think it would keep people more honest. But there, there are ideas. There are a lot of ideas. That, so that, those are good ideas that it's a little bit beyond what we as legislators do. Correct. So, but I'm glad that you voiced them because it could give people a chance to think. I, I just have a quick question. I'm just um, wondering, you know, do you, do folks um, in your positions have opportunities to talk with other folks in other facilities? You know, so. You know, everybody sort of expressed the, you know, reluctance to maybe move to this because of seniority, but, you know, it depends you on how, how far you put yourself out there, right? So, fortunately, I'm on our SRP team, so I get to meet with a lot of people from other facilities because we train together time to time. So, I know people in a lot of other places, and quite frankly, I'm sitting here in front of you because I have a big mouth. <laughs> and it, it is what it is. You I have a lot of passion. Yes, I, I do. And thing. I don't mind speaking my mind. Yeah. So I get to connect with a lot of mm -hmm. other people because of that as well. So, no, it's not always, like I said, things aren't perfect in corrections right now. I just think but, sometimes hearing from colleagues who have been in the same, been in their shoes and have seen a different way and seen right. it sometimes is helpful to, to hear. To answer your question, sometimes the facilities can be fairly secluded. But we do get around, we do have concepts, we do talk to other facilities, we have friends in other facilities, we have code trainings in other facilities. So we do get to see how it is in other facilities. So we're gonna close this in too, because I do want to get and it's noon time, so I want to talk you for to your time. You. Thank, thank you for being here. Thank you folks for coming in. Well, thank we you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Shawanda. Thank you. Sorry, bro. They almost let. Um, the next piece on our schedule, 
it's noon time. Do you quickly want to do this 15 minutes and take lunch, or do you? I have a 12 o'clock meeting, so I have to excuse myself. Not others. Keep doing it and finish up in 15 minutes. Okay. Does that mean we're starting at one o'clock again? Yeah. What am I gaining there? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need a full hour lunch. We get back at lunch. At the end of the day, boss. Superintendent from the special facility on it. No, she's scheduled. Okay. So whomever wants to come up, Commissioner, come on up. I think Travis is down. Travis. Unless you really want to hear from me. So for folks, you did get this. Um, there was a it deals with um, a situation this summer that occurred at the Springfield facility. It doesn't matter what facility it occurred at, it could occur at any facility. Um, there are some issues in our facilities with um, rising temperature of our climate to begin with, which is really having an impact on our correctional facilities. So concrete buildings. Uh, very little airflow. We have put in in the capital bill money to go towards air conditioning of our facilities. It's a heavy lift. I forgot what the total amount was 20, 25 million total for four facilities. For all, five. Well, so yeah. Yeah, well, you get chitin in as already. And eight or nine and a million. Yeah. So uh, we put in some money to go forward, I believe it's almost 5 million, to go forward with an HVAC system and they're gonna start the Springfield facility, but that will not be up and running until probably closer to 2027, 26, end of 26, 27, which is a much longer time frame than anyone had ever anticipated. In the interim, there were some situations that had occurred with a couple uh, staff members who had some heat related issues that did need some medical attention. Um, and we had a letter uh, from the Department of Labor, OSHA, vote to um, VOSHA to put in some corrective actions. And I want an update on this. I want to see where we are with this. And every, we do have this letter, I believe, posted on our webpage, but every uh, many member did receive a letter, copy of the letter. Yep, I'm familiar with the letter and happy to speak to it, although uh, may not might not be quite as succinctly as Michaela Merrill would, but I did work with Michaela on, on the corrective action. I'm aware of the letter, I don't have it pulled up. So can um, you just identify yourself? For oh, I'm sorry, yes, I'm, I'm back. Uh, oh, you're back, Travis. Yep, Travis Dedson, the, the facilities division director. Um, at least today, and uh, we're going to try to keep that trend going. Um, and yes, uh, Southern State, I'm aware of the, the VOSHA letter, the corrective actions that were asked for. And and to give just a tiny bit of background, the annual key illness prevention um, kind of efforts and need. Um, I, over the last three years, um, since coming to central office for the first two years I was there, I sat as a member of the statewide risk management committee, uh, safety committee, um, and this would come up every year. And it was, I want to say, three years ago that we worked with BGS, Steve Hubs from BGS was the person I worked with, who essentially we said we need a heat illness prevention plan to at least get, let's let's get this ball rolling and get the information out there. So we use that as a framework and we started that and we have that on our SharePoint and we, we disseminate it again every year annually to kind of bring everybody's attention to um, that this is a thing and that rather than as in years past, sometimes we would feel like on our heels a little bit, like, hey, July is coming, it's gonna be hot, don't buy fans in July during a heat wave because there are none. You know, let's get some in April and May. Um, and then every year we, so we, we start that heat illness prevention plan um this year was particularly brutal i think nobody would and and again i would say that i i worked in the uniform for 15 years and two of those years were at springfield so springfield is particularly hot i don't know if it has to do with just it's on a hill it's on a hill it's a little closer to the sun it's there's no cover and the way it was built is the way it was built um nonetheless those corrective actions we updated that heat illness prevention plan We've developed a training that we can do within 
we could call it a roll call training and we're going to hopefully work with our uh, corrections academy to maybe kind of stick that in as like a lunchtime training you know 10 slides or less that speaks to those corrective actions and, and then standardizing that heat illness plan across the um, department so it's not just a link on our SharePoint, but it's a, it's much more codified and much more elevated in its um, in its visibility. Um, it's something that we have to think about at least a couple months every year. Uh, things that we did, we uh, so in that corrective action plan, Southern State to start with this year is is they've been cleared. Work with a vendor, get light colored, breathable, reflective um, clothing shirts as an option for the for the uh, staff. They're in that process. That is part of the corrective action plan is one of the suggestions. Um, they have, and they continue to make sure that there is water. I mean, Southern State actually has like a, um, a slushy machine. Um, they have a cooling, uh, cooling stations that they put in the yard. At one point, the station was inoperable, I found out. And I told them, buy a new one. We don't have to try to fix the old one. Let's get a new one. Um, we purchased facility uh, uh, system-wide we had each superintendent uh, buy what is called um, uh, cooling towels. And this was a recommendation that came from that statewide uh, labor, uh, or, or sorry, um, risk management <clears throat> committee. They were very expensive. You, I assume you guys are familiar with them, but they're a towel to hold the moisture, put cold water on, put around your neck. And we made sure that we bought, you know, at least a hundred freeze facility to give to staff. Um, we haven't planted trees or put up tents in Southern state or, or, or provided like as much shade. Uh, there, there's some security I, um, obstacles around some of those things, but there may be some solutions that we can continue to work on, but this is um, top priority. Um, the corrective action, I don't have the, I wanna say there was four or five bullets, but a lot of it was about communication to staff, uh, training to the staff, uh, knowledge about medications and, and um, health situations that could be complicated underneath the heat situation, which has been built into that uh, PowerPoint training that we designed to be able to give, you know, 15 minutes at a time over and over through the hot months of the of the year. Um, those are the things that come off the top of my head, other than the actual big fix, which is lots of money, BGS. Right. I don't want to get into the HVAC system because what most people was requiring of DOC was within 30 days of receiving this letter, which was you received the letter July 24th. So by the end of August, you needed to submit to VOSHA in writing whether you intend to implement the heat injury and illness prevention program. Was that done? That was done. Yep, I have. A, I know I have a copy of the email uh, that Michaela sent to the person who's indicated in that letter at the. I think on the last page. <clears throat> so then, then they go on to say that if you choose to implement the heat injury illness prevention program, you need to provide in written written outline of the program within 120 days. So it's like six months, right? No, four months, three months, four months. <laughs> Four months. Four months. You got it. From the end of July. So that's by the end of this year. So is there the intent to do that? Yes, there is. And that's underway. And we've communicated that and, and have shared our, our updated heat on this plan and our efforts as far as the shirts and uh, oscillating fans in every unit and things like that. Um, and well, we just have just barely developed the PowerPoint training, but we used the, uh, which was helpful, we used Bosch's letter as a framework for that training, it's trained to the test, right? If this, uh -huh. these are the spots where they're saying we're deficient, let's prioritize those in the training. And that's what we've done. And our heat illness prevention plan has the heat index and a, a urine chart, believe it or not, um, and all sorts of things to kind of help educate people on their mm -hmm. So in terms of the, I'm looking at the work practice control and one thing that really stands out to me, if you're low on staff, one thing that they're asking is availability of relief workers for assistance as needed and to ensure frequent work and rest schedules. How can that be done if you're understaffed? Well, that is the million dollar question for sure. And I think, you know, our intention is to do that and do that as well as absolutely possible with the resources we have, especially in those summer months. If we, 
if we have 60 people, we've got to really think on our feet, whether that is, okay, I've got a float and I'm going to start doing some post swapping where the float's going to go to the unit for a couple hours instead of just for 15 minutes. And I might let that person who is the float work a unit and that unit worker work as a float so they have a little more access to some of the cooler areas of the building. Um, floats while not while on duty, it's not a break, but it's a preferred position because you have the ability in between the waves of work to kind of have a little downtime. Now, as as more ships come in, we get more staff, this all becomes more possible. And I think that's been hit on the head over and over today, which is the answer to all of this is a good plan supported by a good amount of staff. Our intention is to give as many breaks as we can to give as much uh, robust kind of work day as you were talking about the type of work during the day um, to include things like heat illness prevention and when we have more people we can do a better job of it without more people we have to rely on the people that you just met to really think on their feet and figure out how to co uh, collaborate work as a team for the greater good of everybody and that does happen and we are this is our attempt at being more direct when it comes to heat illness to make sure that those strategies are well known and that they're implemented by our supervisors, not just because the superintendent says it, but because of the supervisor on Saturday night on July 8th, when it's 85 at midnight, is thinking, okay, we got nothing going on. Let's why don't you go swap people out of the units for a couple hours and get them up to the slushy machine, you know, that type of thing. So just for the committee to hear. What VOSHA found when they did a heat index measurement in the facility, and this was done over a period of time, and over um, the hours of about 12.30 to 1.30, and um, it was done on June 19th, the infirmary unit was 86 degrees. Box unit was 90 degrees. The Delta unit was 93. Charlie unit was 91. And Bravo was 88. And if you have that in your home and you're trying to function, those are pretty intolerable temperatures. Plus, it's humid and stuffy mm -hmm. and no air. So, anyway, I just want to bring that to the committee's attention because I think it's a real issue. It's an issue for staff. It's an issue for the residents who are there and to fall back and say, well, we'll take care of it when the air conditioning and HVAC system comes in. That's not for another two or three years. And I'm just really concerned. I'm really concerned. And I'm glad that Bosch is involved because I think these are intolerable situations for the staff and, and our residents there. And it's not just one facility. It's happening in the other facilities too. And that was June. And that was June. That was during the heat wave in June. It was there. Questions? Uh, well, I, my only other one is what, what, if I may, Madam mm -hmm. what is the plan? Well, so, I mean, we, can, we know it's going to take a while to get. Yeah. <clears throat> we can do as many mitigations as possible the cooling vests, changing the uniforms, we can put fans in, but we don't have a means to change the internal climate without an HVAC system. So the goal is to get HVAC throughout the system. We have a couple of facilities that have it. Springfield's the next, that in part is because they have the most vulnerable population. Um, and they have the largest medical unit. The medical unit is air conditioned, although that broke during the heat wave, which was not a huge. Um, but realistically, we, we can do the things that Travis is talking about, and then we need to get the HVAC system online. And that's something that we've advocated for with BGS and the legislature's provided funding for. Um, but strangely, unfortunately, these projects take a lot longer than I think. Need to. Do, do, you have a, do you have any idea of what? what it'll look like in the budget that will be proposed by the governor. Well, the money like the money is underway. Yeah, I mean, there's money there, there. And, and until we get one phase, we can't really move to the next. The last will probably be Northwest because in order to put an HVAC system at Northwest, you need to replace the entire roof. The roof can't sustain that infrastructure. So that's a nine, eight to $9 million 
project by itself. The other ones should be a little easier. Springfield's obviously a very large facility, but that's the one we're doing first in that plan. Go from there. Okay, just, just out of curiosity, as we sit here today, um, Commissioner, what, what, do, what things are you planning to do to make sure that the people in the building and the staff are going to be healthy? As it relates to heat? Yeah. Or in yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just talking about heat. Yeah. Because you just said that the infirmary has an air conditioning unit, and yet it was 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, well, the air conditioning unit in the infirmary broke. The price That's part of the process. Yeah. Um, but is that fixed now? It is fixed. Okay. Okay. So we have the cooling stations at some of the facilities. Um, we have the kind of misting stations or whatever. We have cold beverages, ice. We have the cooling vests. We have the cooling towels that Travis talked about. There's the uniform changes for mm -hmm. staff. Um, and, and, you know, the uniforms that we had were a major change from where we were just a few years ago. And what's the result, Commissioner? What's the result of all that stuff so far in terms of what we read in this letter? Yeah, I mean... What, what is it doing to alleviate the problem that I'm reading here? I think it's helping to an extent, but candidly, I don't think until we get HVAC in, that will be a major change in the internal climate. And to the commissioner's point, Southern State Correctional Facility is our newest correction facility. So it's, it's part 20 of, years it's old. 20 years old, but this, I think, underscores the point that the department is working with very limited infrastructure, that these buildings were never designed for the climate that Vermont is now experiencing. And so as we look to the next chapter of corrections and hopefully make investments, since I know we did in Capitol Hill last year, to allocate funds for new correctional facilities, we need to build them with this in mind. Okay, I, I, I get what you're saying, but in the meantime, you know, the cooling vests and all that stuff, I'm, I'm just asking, is it working? Um, We're still having well, problems. We haven't seen folks really take advantage of the cooling vests as much. Um, I'm not sure why that is. They're available uh, at all the facilities. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, we can we can do our best to provide as many resources as possible and, and hope that folks take advantage of those opportunities. Um, and then try, you know, we've looked at doing mini splits or other types of kind of smaller scale options, but I, I don't know if you've been to our facilities, but they're just not designed in a way that are- Been to them years ago, but not recently. Yeah. Oh, well, they haven't changed. <laughs> <laughs> It serves to that point. I think we're, if there's an area for us to improve, uh, you know, because people do have to avail themselves to what we have, but there's times that maybe not everybody understands it's there, right? And I think we can do a better job, and I can specifically be a part of that solution with working with the superintendents and leadership need site to not only do I try to get the word out and kind of ring the bell every year that, hey, it's going to get hot, but I can really ring that bell and make a commitment to continue to ring that bell and keep it at the front of everybody's mind as we go into those hot months and um, <clears throat> also verify more and, and make sure that, you know, when we've, when I've sent something in, in early May and it's kind of beautiful out that I'd love to see what we've done in response and make sure those fans are in place, make sure those staff who have wanted to buy their own little mini desk fan that you put ice in for 20 bucks on Amazon that they they know, go ahead, bring it in. Here's some batteries. Like there's little things that we can do to promote this and keep it at the top of the mind. So hopefully people take better advantage. And it's, I shouldn't call it cold comfort, right? But it, it, it's little comfort when you have a building that's 90 degrees that you can't control, but we can do a better job of making sure people know what they can do, I think. So we need to close up because I know some folks need to get to lunch here. And I know Shawanda wanted to indicate some things. I've asked Megan to connect with Shawanda to submit some written testimony about this. So any other questions of Travis before we take a break? I'm just curious if there's any heating issues in the winter, given that concrete is so unforgiving. Yeah. Oh. Are, are we bracing now for winter? And do you have like space heaters or things um, that you do in the winter? Yeah, we, there, there's a, depending on the facility, there's a dance that occurs for sure. And some of our facilities are, are wood fired. 
Um, and uh, run on, I'm, I'm looking at my friend in Newport there, uh, who <laughs> there are times where these, these, these old infrastructures, I don't know who was on that design team, but they it's needed- It's set in the 90s. Yeah, yep, so. In the early 90s, so wood, boy, wood chip, and I think Springfield's a wood chip. I think they're making the- yeah, there. It's short answer. Yes, it happens. Um, not everywhere. And what correction officers and correction people are good at are um, pivoting with the unknown of the day, and that's what we do. And that's what they do. Thank you, Travis. Thank you, VSEA. Thank you, officers coming in. DOC. Let's take our lunch break back at one. And then we got raise the age. Now I'm going to hand it over to Mark.